So welcome, and thank you for being here as we begin our discussion on environmental justice and how we can build a community within the League of Women Voters to advocate for people in communities who have historically been underserved and underrepresented. Next slide, please. So now that we know a bit about who's here uh, and who you are, let's meet our team. So Jeannie, would you like to start and tell us a bit about yourself? Sure, I've been a league member for a little over 15 years. And in my local league, I've been president and program chair, and I'm now a chair of the criminal justice committee. And at the state level, I'm on the food, soil and agriculture committee. I have a bachelor's in biology and was the faculty advisor for the environmentalist club at the high school where I taught for 30 years. Thank you. Posey, how about you? Hi, I'm Posey McKinney, and I recently joined the League of Women Voters, and I'm a mem member of the Sustainability and Environmental Justice Committee. And from that perspective, I've become interested in environmental justice, not just the need for it, but how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I see the importance of becoming involved, and because of my concern, I'm here to learn all that I can and find my part in this movement for environmental justice. Thank you. Chrissy, tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, oh my name is Chrissy Testison and I'm a graduate student in marine biology at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Um, I joined the League of Women Voters in 2020 and became involved in the Sustainability and Environmental Action Committee to learn more about what's being done to mitigate human impact on the environment in San Diego, um, as well as what's being done or needs to be done uh, to support environmental justice communities. Um, so I'm here to continue learning how I can be of service in that area. My name is Ruth Sandman, and I'm the chairperson of the Sustainability and Environmental Action Committee for the League of Women Voters San Diego. I used to say that I was, I'm retired, but then I joined the League of Women Voters and you all know what that means. <laughs> uh, what inspired me to make environmental justice an issue of concern for our sustainability committee was realizing that over my 50 years of living in San Diego, the neighborhoods of concern for uh, during my teens are still the same neighborhoods of concern today, and there's really been no change. With the compounding effects of climate change, this begs for me a pretty big question. However, I'm excited because I'm seeing some amazing possibilities uh, in San Diego, which we'll tell you more about later. But it seems to me like the League of Women Voters could be a major player. So probably like many of you, I'm here to explore. Next slide, please. Our goals for this session are to develop a basic understanding of environmental justice and to explore the League of Women Voter role in advocating for environmental justice and against environmental racism. Next slide, please. So before we begin, we'd like to know um, a bit about what you know about environmental justice. So please answer the poll questions in the chat and let's see, let's see where we're starting. So how involved are you in environmental justice and are you a member of a disadvantaged community? So Pam is engaged in community action. And let's see, uh, these are coming in really fast. So I don't know, Jeannie and Posey may have to help me. Read some of these. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a lot of them are just learning. Just and, learning. Uh, I know Vicki Riggs is involved in community action here in San Diego. And I saw a couple others that just zipped right past. There we go. Just learning, okay. Christy. Um, just learning, Maggie, just learning. And uh, I those seen are not yet. members of disadvantaged communities that I've seen so far. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen any yeses for that yet. 
Greg well, is and Monica brings up a good point where she's living in a partially disadvantaged community. True. So while I, my community is not disadvantaged in the big scheme of things, within my city, we are the poorest part. Okay, thank you, Grace. And you've been on the front lines. You've been very involved in community. Well, this happened by accident. And we have, and if those of us not in a position to push back, don't do anything, it's gonna self-perpetuate and compound, like you said. So, right. Right. We'll see some of that in the video. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Karen, involved locally, not disadvantaged. Okay, good. Um, well, now uh, and here's Amira Mansour in Irvine, not disadvantaged, a member of many environmental organizations, NGOs, and is well aware of the issue. Linda, not involved, not a member of a disadvantaged, disadvantaged community. Okay. Thank you. Great, great. Well, now that we know uh, a bit of, about a bit more about your involvement, here's Jeannie to talk about what's happening in San Diego. All right. So yeah, we've had a number of things that have just recently happened. Um, the Climate Equity Fund is a part of a plan to spend nearly five million dollars a year boosting low-income and ethnically diverse neighborhoods most affected by climate change. The money would be spent building parks, planting trees, increasing exercise opportunities, making areas more walkable, and bolstering public transit. Uh, the annual revenue sources for this fund will come through the gas tax, the regional half-cent sales tax for local transportation, and gas and electric franchise fees. Which products, uh, projects will be funded will be de determined during the city's annual budget process. Environmental justice as part of the city cap. Um, in March of this year, the city council voted unanimously to include the climate equity fund to support the mayor's climate action plan. Um, this plan is an update of our 2015 climate action plan. This was possible because in 2019, San Diego established the nation's first of its climb, kind climate equity just index, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So once we had a climate equity index, we could use those numbers as benchmarks and indicators where the attention needed to go. This community-based tool enables the city to measure the equity impacts of the climate action plan. And then in the county of San Diego, the San Diego Board of Supervisors voted unanimously just last month to create an office that will help county officials incorporate climate and environmental justice into the county's future actions. The office will focus on um, helping the county reduce air pollution and reduce exposure to toxic chemicals, particularly in communities of color. The county will set up the office over the next three months. This is a big change for our county, which had been sued by the Sierra Club for its ineffective climate action plans. So as you can see, much of what has been happening in San Diego is brand new, just in the last couple of months. Our city and county have replaced a number of city council members, the mayor and supervisors recently. Elections do matter. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Climate Equity Index um, was developed by the City of San Diego in collaboration with community-based organizations and the University of San Diego's Energy Policy Initiative Center, which worked with them to develop the methodology by, uh, for assessing equity citywide. This equity analysis identifies our most vulnerable populations by assessing the relative access to opportunities for each census tract. There were 35 indicators um, that were selected to measure the equity across the city based on input from the working group and research on nationwide best practices. Those 35 indicators are summarized into these five, environmental, socioeconomic, housing, health and mobility. Next slide, please. And you can see here that um, 
the index assessed all 297 census tracts that are in the city and developed standardized indicators to calculate a, a climate equity index score from zero to 100 for each tract that can be compared to the score of the others. So based on this assessment, all 297 census tracts that are in the city um, got a, a score from zero to 100 for each tract. Um, so the average score turned out to be about 61. So census tracts that score above that have more access to um, opportunities. And those 172 tracts scored um, below average, um, I'm sorry, 125 tracks scored below average with low or low um, moderate access to opportunity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so now we have a short video that we think is a concise explanation of environmental justice and how our communities became inequitable. And by the way, this is free on YouTube if you'd like to use it with your communities. All right. Okay, so this is a city. Here are all the people living in it, people of all different colors, ages, wealths, and incomes. Except they don't all live together in the same place. They're separated into different parts of the city by what color they are, what language they speak, and how much money they have. And those different parts of the city look quite different. The parts that are whiter and wealthier tend to have green spaces, grocery stores with nutritious organic food, and of course, somebody to buy it, and are often far away from pollution emitting freeways. The parts that are poorer and more diverse tend to have industrial sites, heavy duty diesel polluted ports and highways, and hazardous waste, all things that the city relies on to run properly, but that heavily pollute the air and water. And even if they had those grocery stores with nutritious organic food, most residents there couldn't afford it anyway. How did this happen? Well, this segregation can be traced back to race-based zoning and housing policies, but it wasn't always as deliberate as plain old racism. Some separations can simply be traced to poor land use planning. And as a result, these residents of the same city live very different lives. Say the city realizes it has an emissions problem. It comes up with a plan to reduce air pollution, plant more trees to suck up the carbon or start a cap and trade program. But those trees get planted in the neighborhoods that are already green. And the factories that are spewing toxins into the air just buy more carbon offsets and keep spewing their toxins. The benefits of these programs are enjoyed by the communities that are already doing just fine. And the communities that were hurting most from all that air pollution, well, they're still hurting. This isn't just an imaginary city, this is the story of real cities all across the U.S. where people might live in the very same area code, but their race, ethnicity, or wealth and income bracket causes them to experience wildly different quality of air, water, and life. In fact, it can even mean that they also experience different deaths. That's how serious this stuff is. This kind of inequity expands far beyond cities too. Rural areas are full of commercially valuable resources like oil and coal, and they're also home to indigenous and low income communities. But when those resources are extracted, those communities don't see any of the money and they end up with all the air and water contamination that's left over from the extraction. And we even see this injustice on a global level, like in small island nations that are forced to directly confront the consequences of rising sea levels, but haven't played any significant role in the industries that are causing climate change. These peoples are sometimes forced to flee their homes because their land is literally going underwater. But the very states that did play a hand in creating climate change don't have migration policies to accommodate them. So when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about how we can try to break down and reimagine a system that's built up on these inequities. A system where those who are already disadvantaged because of their race and economic status are made poorer because they're unable to profit from the resources that the world depends on and are made sick or worse by the environmental contamination that comes with extracting those resources. Social inequities are intimately tied to the environment. That's why social justice is an environmental issue too.
Okay, so now we'd like to have a discussion and hear from you all about any thoughts that came up for you while watching the video or anything that you learned. And if you all want to either raise your hand or drop your comments in the chat, we'll just go around and hear from you on these questions. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and X out of the PowerPoint just for a moment um, so that we can see each other while we discuss. Kathleen, have a question? What is the YouTube video called? What is the title of it, Ruth? Do you know offhand? Um, an Explanation of Environmental Justice. So Grace says, yikes, do not conflate organic food with sustainability. They are different and overlapping, but organic food is not any more inherently sustainable than conveniently grown food. Conventionally grown food. Yeah. And conventionally, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Comments? Questions? Learn anything? I'm just really surprised. This broadens it so much more. I mean, saving the Earth's climate was a big enough thing. And now you've taken it another step. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. So why so, would, wait, why who would made this it? again? Sorry, say that again? Uh, who made this film? Um, it's a company called Grist. Oh, Grist, OK. Mm -hmm. And so Anne says she's struck by the fact that cap and trade can be used to keep polluting. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> cap and trade is one yeah. of those things that we call a, an environmental cloak, right? Right. Yes. Go ahead. Slippery slope. Well, let me tell you about how it was gamed in California. <laughs> So Monica uh, asked, what would equal access look like when we still need to access the resources to make our country work? Would wealthy people need to live near the resource impacted area? Interesting question. Do you wanna talk about that, Grace, or should we just pose questions and... Um, I mean? Well, that, that's actually a question that I've been studying, especially, especially because of what's happening in LA County, and I'll get more into that later. Okay. And uh, see, Vijaya says environmental justice gas has been around for many decades. US EPA, Cal EPA, all included. And Vicki Riggs, the idea of sharing profits within the communities that are impacted by the extraction of resources is a new idea for me. Has that been getting any traction in legislation? I don't know <clears throat> about legislation. I haven't seen too much. The only legis recent legislation I've seen was uh, from mothers out front that want to make a, a barrier around um, like oil fields in the Central Valley between a put a barrier between the industrial uh, oil fields and the living, the communities where people live just because of pollution so bad. But like in and the I Central think... Valley, it's like, it's the farming that is destroying everything. Has been. But I... uh, changing, uh, changing the, the types of farming and not using all the pesticides and that sort of thing. Um, that whole thing on, if you've seen the video called Kiss the Ground, Mm -hmm. um, changing our ways of, of farming will make the water cleaner, the soil, the air, all of that much cleaner. Yeah. And some of those are sharing the profits. There's a whole, there's a whole nonprofit industrial complex in making these videos, but they're telling a very selective truth. Um, 
I, I don't even know where to begin with Kiss the Ground. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know where to begin. Anyway, go on. Um, Amira has a question. Amira, you want to unmute yourself and ask? Sorry, I'm trying to find the. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me take the hand down. Sorry. Uh, I just was going to actually answer. There was a question in the chat about um, paying back for extraction. Alaska has a tradition that this has had for years. They pay uh, essentially a dividend to every, actually every person in Alaska, not just, I think, I think they pay not just for adults, but for children. I may be wrong on that, how they do it, but they all get, um, you know, upwards of a thousand dollars, I think, every year. It's a sovereign wealth fund because, um, from the extraction taxes. It, exactly, it's an extraction related uh, reimbursement. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially though, the lower 48 and everybody else that buys Alaskan uh, fuel, fossil fuels is sort of subsidizing that. But anyway, that is one example. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anything otherwise. So. My data might be wrong, but but I remember when California tried to get an oil depletion allowance, it was uh, it was on the ballot, and it was talked down that it was going to you know increase our gas prices, etc. But at that time, they said that Oklahoma, Texas, um, all of these oil producing states had oil depletion allowances, except for California, and we consider ourselves so environmental and and aggressive in that and yet um yeah. yeah that's interesting because i've never heard that they have now there's a difference between how you write it off if you're the company extracting and that would be a depletion and um you know so maybe the terms got con conflagrated somehow i don't know but i hadn't heard that they're giving anything back unless they're the landowner and getting uh you know fees that way no, you, it goes to the state it doesn't go to the individual like it does in mm -hmm. But um, California has not ever been able to pass up. Can someone who's talking on the phone or has someone else talking in the background mute themselves so we don't have to hear? Can you hear some? Okay, that stopped. I think it's good. Yeah. Mary Ann asked a really good question, which is about the housing element that we're all required to um, file with HCD, Housing and Community Development this year. Can I do my short presentation and then, because that's really what my thing is about. Well, we were just going to do some definitions and then okay. put you on. Can we do okay, that? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so maybe we should um, go back to the next slide and I, I think um, I think Posey's on. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. And maybe we can get back to some of those comments uh, at the end of the chat there after Dr. Ping's presentation. Uh, so to frame our discussion of environmental justice, we feel it is important to present the definitions. The state of California defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people of all races, cultures, incomes, and national origins with respect to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Um, next slide, please. The League of Women Voters California California's position on climate and environmental justice is that both acknowledge that global warming affects communities differently, hitting hardest communities made most vulnerable due to geographical location, socioeconomic status, race, and national identity. Next slide, please. The League of Women Voters California definition of climate justice focuses on dismantling the barriers that create inequities on a global scale. For example, restructuring society, addressing income inequality, decreasing dependence on fossil fuels, etc. And it concentrates on the future in an ecological sense and with building resilience to prepare for the inevitable outcomes of climate change. Next slide. The League of Women Voters California 
definition of environmental justice focuses on preventing and repairing negative environmental effects in marginalized communities. Next slide. And we would just like to add that environmental justice happens when communities have equal protection under the law and the right to live, work, and play in communities that are safe, healthy, and free of life-threatening conditions. Thank you, Posey. So um, we're fortunate today to have someone with us who has been working front and center on environmental justice issues. Dr. Grace Peng is a natural resources chair for the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles County and the Beach Cities. Previously, she worked as a weather and climate analyst for a couple of national labs. Her work included preparing data used in weather and climate models and help users from government and industry use data effectively to make their decisions. Dr. Peng holds a BA in mathematics and a BS in chemistry from UC Berkeley, as well as a PhD in chemical physics from the University of Colorado Boulder. We'll have time for a few questions for Dr. Peng after her presentation, so please put them in the chat as you think of them. In the meantime, please mute your microphones. Welcome, Dr. Peng. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, I have been, um, I signed up, I've been a member, lead member since 2015 when I was working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. A longtime friend was going to a meeting and I asked her, you know, why do you go to so many uh, league meetings? I thought that was for like po political science types. And she and I had both been math undergrads. And she says, no, league needs technical people. In fact, you'd be perfect, come, come with me. And the next thing I know, I'm doing energy analysis for the Boulder League. And, uh, and they became a lot of the people I socialized with when I was in Boulder. So when I moved back to LA uh, for family reasons, I, um, I wasn't in a workplace. And so I signed up to be a local league in my local league. And then pretty soon I found myself the natural resources chair for both the city, my city, my local chapter and my county <laughs> level. And I feel qualified, I feel very well qualified to talk about environmental issues because that's what I studied all my life. However, what I didn't realize is that all of our environmental issues are due to racism in cars. They're, you know, like you peel away the layers of the onion and in the, at the core, it's always racism, whether or not people wanna say that that's what it is. And, um, and cars and are just this windshield bias and the fact that we've built a system where we can run, we can work in the city centers and then drive to suburban areas away from people that aren't like us and that we can drive through the neighborhoods and poison people all along our way and then claim that it's nothing can be done about that. Yeah, you know, it's always cars and the physical separation of people. And so that's how I became a road, a warrior against housing segregation and cars because we're never gonna get a handle on climate change when 44% of LA County's greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation of which most of it is our private automobiles and electrifying all of our electricity sources is, it, is gonna make 4% of a difference versus um, the 44% of the transportation that we're not touching unless we drastically change our land use policies. So um, the, this, this year, every city, uh, every jurisdiction in California has to send Sacramento a new housing element and a plan to produce housing um, based on everyone's quota is based on their access to clean air, clean water, their access to jobs and economic opportunity and good schools. So if you have good schools, um, if you have good access to jobs and trans uh, and a central location, you'll get a big score, and then they'll take and then they'll start subtracting. So if you have dirty water, if you have dirty air, they'll start subtracting, and then what was subtracted from the areas that have environmental deficits is added back into the healthier areas. And so we build up so and over so through this iterative process, we build up um, 
what's called a regional housing needs allocation for every jurisdiction. And, and I'm gonna tell you that if, what has happened in the past is that people are living in the dirty areas. People are living in San Bernardino. People are living over here in Palmdale. They're living here not because they want to, so often they work in the city centers. They're living here because we will not allow housing to be built in the healthy areas near good jobs. And um, so uh, the um, HCD has created these very useful maps that interactive maps that you can go on and then I'll put that in the chat box so you can play around with that. And later on in the week, we're going to talk in the housing element thing, we're going to talk to um, teach people how to be a housing element watchdog for their city. And, um, and you'll see over here, there, this year we're doing something different. It's not just the economic opportunities, but we're also doing um, an opportunity of um, the total environmental pollution burden of an area. And this is very, very important. Um, let me show you what the state looks like. If we don't, we have not been building housing near the coast, which has been pushing people into the Central Valley. And the Central Valley has agricultural chemicals. It has toxic dust. It has val in endemic valley fever, for which you can manage it, but there's like no cure. It's extremely hot. It's like 120 degrees in the shade often. Or out in the desert in LA, we're pushing people out into the desert. Not only is that killing the pristine um, and very delicate desert systems, but we're also putting people where it's over 110 degrees, maybe um, one third of the year. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. We're putting people where it's so hot that the asphalt off gases. You don't even have to have a car on the street. The smog is coming off of the asphalt because it's so hot, the asphalt is melting and sublimating into the air. So if we in the green areas do not build, we put people in these really untenable situations. And then, and then we blame the victim, and then we blame the victim for driving through um, into work. They should be taking public transit, but there's just no way. Um, so even within, so even, so even within a jurisdiction like, like um, Redondo Beach is a uh, 66,000 people and we have to come up with 2,500 housing units. Uh, Los Angeles, which is very centrally located, they have 4 million people and they're expected to produce 4,500,000 units in the next, re next RENA cycle between 2021 and 2029. That's very difficult. but. LA, LA City has 15 city council districts, which are roughly equal in population. So if, so at a baseline, so at a baseline, you should be putting 1 15th in every city council district, and then going back iteratively and subtracting from the unhealthy areas and adding it to the healthy areas. But that's actually not what's happening. And that's not what happened in San Diego. I mean, San Diego was told that you are, it only in partial compliance and you have to um, like that was a, your first draft was accepted but go back and redo it because that was not good enough right because you distributed it, uh, San Diego and LA both distributed it, the housing in the poorest neighborhoods and in the um, in the poorest neighborhoods while leaving the single family zoning on large lots largely intact and let me show you what I do not, what we're fighting against in Los Angeles. This is, I don't know how many of you drive to Los Angeles, but this is roughly the area of downtown Los Angeles. And as you're driving through on the freeway, we've all seen this, like who lives in these apartment towers right in the middle of freeway intersections? They're, they're here, they're in every, they're next to every freeway in LA. And the reason that they're here is there's no NIMBY resistance against building in these horrible, horrible zones right by the freeway. And meanwhile, you look at this, this area is called Central LA, Hancock Park, Central LA. This area is really close. It's really close to downtown LA. There's a subway that runs every few minutes and gets you to downtown LA in 13 minutes. And yet, 
even though we've spent billions and billions of dollars on a subway system, they cling to these single family um, home status. They will not, apartments are not allowed anywhere in this air, Hancock Park area. So, but LA tried to say, that's okay, we'll build more apartments in Koreatown, which has like no parkland, or we will build more, we will build more apartments over here, over here, right next to the freeway. I mean, it's, they always, they always keep the white single family home tree leafy things um, alone while building ever more, um, ever more homes in, uh, and displacing the um, sensitive communities. And the only way that we can to prevent, to slow down climate change, we have to densify in the urban core. There is no way around densification, but you can do densification right, which is you build up. You, you, this is the way that it's done in other countries. You build up and you leave open space between the buildings. And so, but you'll see that another tactic that is used by the defenders of the status quo is to use height limits. They say, we're built out, we're built out, there's no more room. Well, there is room, but they have a 34, 28, 38 foot tight limit. They, you, we have to build up, not out. And then the second thing that they'll always say is, you don't want us to cut out trees, do you? Because you, we need trees. Um, we need trees in other neighborhoods, maybe not yours. We need a tall, we need a mid-rise apartment in your neighborhood, not more trees. We'll put more trees in little Bangladesh and we'll replace some of the trees in Hancock Park with apartment buildings. So um, anyway, but do you, I noticed that in San Diego, because I've been looking for my in-laws for senior apartments for them, how difficult it is to find new construction that is wheelchair accessible. Like, and that's another thing. If you need modern wheelchair accessible units, where do you find them? There, new construction tends to be near freeways and all the places where you don't want people to live. And then there, within LA County, there is a 15 year life expectancy difference between the cleanest areas and the dirtiest areas. That's 15 years of life stolen from someone. And it's, they're, it's not just stolen from someone, they will be unhealthy for decades of their life. So that's people who are not going to know their grandparents or will only know their grandparents as a shadow of themselves. And so we're, we're really robbing people of um, their lives and their livelihoods when we do not build. And so the new law says that cities are one cities have to reach these minimum targets of housing that they will produce and two if they down zone one part of the city they have to or one part of the jurisdiction they have to add it back in to another part of the jurisdiction because remember the state doesn't tell jurisdictions how they distribute it within their cities or within their jurisdictions but the jurisdictions are supposed to create a plan that is acceptable to uh, Sacramento or HCD. And this is where we need to be watchdogs for our city. Because for instance, in Redondo Beach, um, let me go back to Cal and Barrow screen for Redondo Beach. Um, oh, this is the diesel, this is a diesel pollution in LA County. Um, and I, this is the Cal EPA uh, has created this uh, mapping tool for you so that you can test your local housing element for environmental justice. So you'll see that, like, you'll see how um, the diesel particulates are really bad around the airport and the seaport and then around the freeways, right? And, and yet that's the only place that we've been able to build housing so far recently. And then this is also, um, what we call the traffic. This is what we call the, the traffic um, impacts. Uh, like if, even if we were all in electric cars, which pollute less, they don't pollute, they're not pollution free magic bullets, they pollute less. But 
actually now you're in Europe, they have a lot more electric cars and they've been um, measuring the air. And it turns out electric cars only pollute 90% as much as an ICE car. So they're not a magic bullet at all. Um, but anyway, but what happens is when you live in a freeway, you, when you live near a freeway, you can't leave your house with 100,000 cars going by your front door um, on the freeway uh, every day on the on and off ramps, right? Like, so that means that you're, you're either going to take your life in your hands because people are driving, zooming through your neighborhood, and you're, and, or you're going to get in a metal cage if you can afford one, and that, that just brings more cars. When you move people by the freeways, it means that they're, they're risking their lives if, they, if leave, they leave their house not in a car. And, th and that's one of the things I want to fight against. So what Redondo Beach has done um, is they, they have taken, they've decided, they have downzoned, Redondo Beach has downzoned the healthy part of town, the healthy part of town in the southern end, and put all, and then decided they will put a th half of our housing right here in this little triangle, in this little triangle right here by the freeway. So, and they'll put the other half right here at a dead mall, and, and a, at, which, which is going to be a future light rail station. And this would be a good idea. And this would be a good idea, except for the fact that this arterial has 40,000 vehicles per day. This arterial has 70,000 vehicles per day. Um, this arterial has four, another 40,000, and this arterial has another 30,000. Like just on this corner, just on this corner alone, which is, where a drugstore currently is, a 24-hour drive-through drugstore, they claim they were going to put 77 apartments on top of there with over like what 110 cars circling around them like sharks in a moat. Um, and it's not just the traffic and the traffic pollution, but it's the fact that, uh, it, like I said, the answer is always cars. Do you see, do you see this mobile refinery right here? Um, toxic releases from facilities. Do you see, oh, see this dark area? This is a mobile refinery. And it, and there's actually a blast zone. The place over here, the place over here where they wanna put the housing is inside the blast zone of the refinery. So, and why does the city council and the mayor wanna do this? Well, the answer is always and always racism. <laughs> if you look over here in Redondo Beach, uh, the southern end of Redondo Beach, oh, so you, so you see this Torrance oil field and that's why the refinery is here. Uh, this used to be an oil field. But you see this area is a whites only area. The southern end of Redondo Beach was this whites only area. And then before the um, before World War II, uh, before the turn of the century, the deep heart water harbor for LA was actually in Redondo Beach. And so there was a um, there was a multi ethnic place here because you had to have people who worked in the at, at the port to, to help unload and load. And so th so this was a mixed so this was a mixed area, and that's why it's yellow. Th this is the whites only area, and th this area was considered medium, this area was considered medial red. So this is a, um, this had, this area was Hispanic and white. And this area where I live is, um, oh, this area where I live is called a low red. I mean, and in fact, the real, my, our real estate agent did not want my husband and I, two PhDs to buy a house in this area because he called it felony flats, even though I, he said, oh, this is like where all the criminal element lives. And so I'm a scientist and I go, I look up the data and I find out that my area is actually the low crime area of, of the city. In fact, the Southern end has more crime per capita than the, um, the Northern end where the people of color live. And if you follow the FBI statistics on um, 
crime and crime and white supremacy and violence in America. You'll know that um, you'll know that the um, areas where people are most segregated are the highest crime areas in America. And if you're looking at just reported crime and crimes where um, the police are involved, uh, yes, there, um, black neighborhoods have more arrests, but actually if you're just looking at crimes, including crimes that aren't prosecuted, um, white areas are actually the most, white only areas are the most violent. And then, you know, now that we've seen Trump and white supremacists, we, I think more of the, of the US is waking up to the fact that heavily white areas are very problematic. And, and I'm not saying that everyone who lives in a white only area is a racist, but I'm saying that their environment will improve if they're exposed to people of other, because that will dilute the power that the um, white supremacists that live amongst them have in terms of setting the tone for their neighborhood. And this is, you know, this is from 80 years ago. This is from 80 years ago. And I wanna show you what's happening today. LA County is 26% non-Hispanic white. You know, it's half, LA is half Hispanic and uh, whites are a minority and non-Hispanic minorities, uh, non-Hispanic whites make up a quarter of LA County. But look at these census blocks, 92% non-Hispanic white, 80%, 82, 81. But this is 92%. This is why they down zone because, because the state housing laws are saying you can't say no to apartment buildings anymore. What did they do? Um, they 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 downzoned. They downzoned immediately, and then they added it back up to areas like um, they added it back in to areas that are like um, like thirty one percent, like thirty one, and then over here thirty six percent white. So so there, so if you're looking just so if you're looking at just the census tract level it doesn't look as severe at the census tract level and HCD is only looking at, HCD is going to score your housing element only on the tr at the track level, unless they get someone from, unless they have a watchdog group, send them an alert saying, look, they're playing funny games. They're playing funny games with the day, uh, by targeting their zoning only within certain areas of a census tract. So that so that's something that we want you to be aware of, to look at it both at a block group level and at a track level. Does that make sense? And so that is, um, I, I can answer more questions, but th that's about, these are the gotchas I want you to be aware of. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ping. Um, that was really interesting. And I think lots of great information there to discuss and unpack. Um, we are at about seven more minutes until the hour. So maybe let's take five minutes to go over some of the questions and comments for Dr. Ping in the chat. And also if anybody wants to unmute themselves or raise their hand and jump in, um, feel free to do so. And then we'll take just about two minutes at the end and to wrap things up. Oh, Ruth, I, I see you talking, but I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think Linda Moon um, in Orange County has got a really good question. She asks, she says, the majority of residents strongly oppose high density housing anywhere. How do we best deal with that pervasive attitude? It, it, it is definitely American exceptionalism. Because Asia, Europe, Latin America, we they all realize they all realize because they're based in reality that density is a way that we preserve open space. Right, it, it becomes even more important. I know in San Diego, um, uh, Sandag has identified what they call transit corridors now, and so they're lifting height restrictions 
and um, along those transit corridors so that to make those areas denser, but it's gonna be so important to keep open spaces. Right, and then remember, you can have rooftop parks too. Like yeah. I like we visited, we visited the Chelsea, the High Line in Chelsea, and a lot of the new apartment, a lot of the new apartments and condos going in, they open up, they open up to the High Line, and then they have like green space. Um, the High Line is the public park, and it's like having a front yard with a gate that opens up to the High Line. But you can have elevated, you can have like a series of elevated, uh, so, say you had seven story buildings in this, in a district or whatever, you could all like, you can connect, you can connect them with over, with elevated walkways that keep them above the traffic so that the traffic fatalities aren't so bad. Oh, I wanna show you something uh, again. I wanna share my screen again. Um, this is called the transportation injury map map for California. And you'll see like these red dots are where um, people have been killed or severely maimed um, in traffic collisions. I don't call them accidents because there were a whole series of decisions that were made both by individuals and by governments to allow this to happen. But you'll see that the poor areas of South LA, we we just made them casualties. We made them casualties in that um, we make them breathe the, our exhaust. We make them breathe our tire particles. We make them breathe the um, effluent from um, our airport or our, um, our oil refineries. And we just accept that the, a certain percentage of people are gonna be killed um, and the most vulnerable people too. So you can, uh, so I'll put that link in there. It's built by UC Berkeley, um, but built for the state of California. And, it, and police departments around the state are required to code all their traffic collisions in here. So you can map this out. Um. Monica Marquez would like to know what downzoning means. It means that housing that was previously allowed was taken out of the housing element is no longer allowed. So uh, like Redondo Beach had allowed mixed use along certain roads all throughout the city. And they, in this next housing element, they took all that out. They took out over 15, they took out between 1,600 and 1,800 units of mixed use, much of it in South Redondo, and then added it all back in by the freeway and near the refinery. You mean potential units, right, Grace? Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think we need to move on. It's almost uh, one. So interesting and so much food for thought and so much more to talk about. Thank you. So uh, Amira says something about ADUs. And I know a lot of cities are leaning on um, accessory dwelling units for their low income production because ADUs are often built in someone's backyard so that they, they can house their uh, family member that's low income. But the problem with ADUs is one, they don't produce very much. Like, you know, they're, they're very small, so they're not family size. And, and they're, um, the small size also makes it hard for them to be uh, like wheelchair accessible and all that. But the main problem in, for us is that for, for a, for a, in a single family home neighborhood, for you to have a lot that is large enough to put an ADU, you know, that that meant that you had to have been wealthy enough to have purchased a home in an area that was large lot, which were largely white, non-Hispanic people. And so that perpetuates racial injustice in that white poor people will be taken care of by multi-generational wealth and um, minorities that had been locked out of um, home ownership in the cleaner areas they are then 
going to be locked out of the oppor that opportunity. I really don't see any way around um, combining, combining, allowing people to combine lots and build apartment complexes. And over in Bundy in West LA um, on the Expo Line, there was they had a they had a very nice uh, neighborhood with 1.3 1.5 million dollar homes, but because LA is allowing upzoning near train stations because there's a um, because of Rena and the transit oriented um, housing, they a developer was able to buy a a block that had nine single family homes. And they will be able to um, develop 300 homes where nine homes were once. They were able to create 291 extra homes just by removing the height limit and lowering the parking limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Amira has a question. Yeah. Actually, I don't have a question. I was going to say with respect to the ADUs. I agree, it's not an answer um, to the housing problem, but it's what the state actually gave us, <laughs> essentially. And, um, but the, the size, there are two size, two formats of them, and the size of the larger one probably could be like a two person semi flat because it's a full unit. Um, and they re remove restrictions even from like if you have enough. And, and by this, I mean, like literally you could put one on the top of a garage. So even if you're in an attached townhouse, that, that can't be restricted anymore. I know because our HOA was trying to deal with some other things at the same time. So, you know, that is an inadequate answer to our housing problem. And it doesn't address uh, environment and justice issues because you're still waiting for homeowners who decide to build any kind of extra ADU on their home, but it um, is what they've done so far as to housing issues for the, the fact that we are, have inadequate uh, construction going on to house people of lower means. Anyway, just wanted to answer that a little bit more because I was getting some feedback in the chat. Thank you so much, Amira. Thank you, Dr. Ping. Thank you, everyone, for the great comments and questions in the chat. Um, since we are just a couple of minutes past the hour now, I think what we will do is go ahead and uh, wrap up the presentation. But I just want to say before we go through the last few slides that if anybody needs to sign off um, before we finish, and you would like us to follow up with you. Um, we will follow up to share presentation materials and possibly organize um, future conversations and discussions. Uh, please drop your name and email in the chat and we'll um, put you on our email list to share materials with you. Um, and it would be great if we had more time because these are such, uh, such great discussions. Um, but I will just go ahead and go to our last few slides. Um, so we brainstormed a little bit around um, some ideas for moving forward. Um, now that we've heard some examples from LA County um, and we've you know, talked a little bit about different issues and, and different ideas from people, um, we have brainstormed a bit about what the League of Women Voters can do to support environmental justice goals in San Diego. Um, and these are some of the ideas and possible tools that we've come up with. Um, so to develop a natural resources committee that includes environmental justice, um, voting matters, ask environmental justice questions of candidates for office, hold pros and cons sessions on issues of concern and communities of concern through churches and schools, um, develop or join a listserv for issues uh, and areas of concern and for a call to action on state and environmental justice legislation. Uh, listening, because many of us don't uh, live in communities of concern, so we need to work to develop partnerships and trust with established community groups and use our privilege to uplift those voices without presumption and build relationships with uh, community groups with common goals already involved with environmental justice. 
So on that note, a lot of this work has already been done or is being done in this area uh, with a long history to environmental justice work in general um, and many wonderful organizations from the local up to the national level uh, doing environmental justice work. So we hope to possibly plug in to some of the work that these organizations are doing and support them in ways that are useful for initiatives that they uh, already have or are already operating. And on that note of continuing to learn and collaborate, if you, again, if you would like to be on an email list from us for environmental justice alerts uh, or future conversations, please add your name and email in the chat. And if you're interested in accessing any of the resources used in the presentations today, um, including the presentation slides, you can find those at the link on the bottom of this slide. Um, and I'll turn it over to Ruth. I'm not sure if we have any more time for discussion, but thank you very much for being uh, with us here today. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, I just want to say thank you for attending this first League of Women Voters uh, California Convention Caucus on Environmental Justice. We appreciate everyone's participation. Grace, I owe you lunch. So uh, be well and keep in touch and keep up the good work. Thank you, everybody. Okay, and I put in um, links to all the maps that I showed in the chat box. Great, yeah. I think you're recording, so you'll like be able to send it out to everyone. We're recording and we'll capture the chat, so um, we'll make that available as well, because there's a lot of good discussion in the chat that Thank we can you. get to. Right. <laughs> That's and what I was going to ask. I didn't get to the part about um, paying um, environmental reparations to communities harmed by freeways. Yeah, we got some big work coming up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone.